Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Sam Quinones made a real name for himself back in 2016 when he published the book Dreamland, The True Tales of America's Opiate Epidemic. It's a book that chronicles his travels across the United States as well as Mexico, investigating the opioid pan, uh, pandemic, the addiction pandemic that was occurring, probably still is occurring, but now he is out with a subsequent book, a follow-up in which he takes on issues around fentanyl and meth. It's called The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in a Time of Fentanyl and Meth. He joins me over Zoom. Sam Quinones, it's a great pleasure, sir, to welcome you back to this radio program. Well, thanks very much for having me on again, Mitch. I really appreciate it. Thank you. What, what is fentanyl? Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid, meaning it's made from, uh, unlike heroin and other opioids from the opium poppy, it is made with pure, purely just chemicals. Uh, invented uh, in 1960, and, and it revolutionized anesthesia uh, when it came out. Uh, it allowed for much more uh, uh, kind of surgeries that were not possible, and it allowed for much easier forms of, anesthe of, of anesthetizing folks during those, those surgeries. It's an extraordinarily potent uh, opioid, um, 50 to 100 times more potent than, than morphine, um, and used medically, it is a magnificent drug. I had a heart attack a few years ago, and I had, they gave me fentanyl, and I'm very, very uh, glad they did. Um, however, it has now been discovered in the last 15 years or so, maybe more actually, uh, been discovered certainly by the, by the Mexican drug trafficking world that had been supplying heroin. And, and of course, in the hands of the underworld, it has become an extraordinarily deadly. It's not just potent, it's now deadly in the hands of the underworld. And, and, and really the driver behind our skyrocketing uh, overdose death toll over the last uh, few years. How did it get from being used in the hospital to the streets? Well, it was always, there was always, you know, after fentanyl came out, uh, people understood its potency. And some clandestine chemists would occasionally come out with the stuff and it'd circulate a bit and then it'd disappear and no one would, would really know why. Um, the Mexican trafficking world discovered it in a story that I, I tell in, in The Least of Us um, in 2006. They hired an underground chemist to actually make them ephedrine. This guy was from, he's from Mexico, but he just really grew up in San Diego. Went, uh, went to prison for making fentanyl, got out, was deported, and they, the Sinaloa drug trafficking world, some investors from there, um, and contacted him and said, we'd like to put you up in a, in a lab. We know you, under, you know how to cook this stuff, cook chemicals well. Um, we would like you, you to make ephedrine, which is a precursor in one method of making methamphetamine. Uh, but he really wanted to make fentanyl, so uh, he told uh, pro uh, uh, narcotics agents later, um, he said, yeah, sure, let's do it. And, and instead of making ephedrine, he made fentanyl. And at first, the, the Sinaloa guys were fairly upset with him. What, what, what are you doing? You know, what's the, this is not what our money was for. And he said, no, you don't understand. What I'm making for you is the most potent heroin substitute that has ever been invented and will make you profits like you cannot imagine and it was that moment when kind of the lights go on in the Sinaloa drug cartel and we go oh so we can make this instead of growing poppies we can make this almost you know, as, as long as we have the chemicals we can make this year year round and that that fentanyl really marked that he made in that lab in the town called Toluca and on outside Mex an industrial city outside Mexico City um, was really the first mass die-off, frankly, created the first ma mass die-off during to, to fentanyl. There was th thousands of people uh, uh, died during this brief, like, nine-month period when he was producing this fentanyl in Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, Philly, uh, various places. It was busted in 06, uh, went to prison. I, inter I interviewed uh, narcotics agents who interviewed him at, at great length and uh, told him the story. But that was when the Sinaloa guys first figured it out. And they, of course, are more capable than just your underground uh, kind of wacky chemist in, in the United States. They have these kind of, they have huge amounts of, of, uh, of money and so on. And they never forgot it. In uh, uh, several years later, as our opioid epidemic was in full, uh, you know, form uh, all across the country, 
uh, China, Chinese chemical companies began making fentanyl. The Mexican guys hadn't forgotten what fentanyl was. They knew what fentanyl was. Now they began buying a lot of that from China. Uh, China began sending uh, pounds and kilos of the stuff too to just uh, underground deal dealers here in the United States via the mail. Uh, this was the early days of fentanyl, say 13, 14, 15. Then China cracked down on fentanyl. And the Chinese the government, the, the government would crack on down. So it wasn't exactly. the government they, who was making they, it. They cracked down on it and never. And, and, and so since then, the chemicals companies have not been selling fentanyl. They do sell the ingredients, but the main uh, uh, one main customer for their ingredients are the Mexican drug traffickers in Sinaloa and, and elsewhere who are now making it. So that's kind of how we come to be this main uh, uh, target for, for fentanyl. And of course, it's all it's all based on the. Uh, the population of newly addicted opioid uh, uh, consumers uh, due to our opioid epidemic. Well, that's, that's my next question. Did did the opioid pandemic or epidemic uh, wane and then this took over or did it just seamlessly go from opi opioids to fentanyl? No, I think it pretty much seamlessly went from one 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 to the next you know so um um I, the 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 key thing was when i was living in i lived in mexico for 10 years and when i was down there you know heroin nobody really wanted to deal heroin no one wanted to sell heroin it was a it was a scuzzy drug and nobody really thought it had much profit potential uh, because the market in the united states was very very limited and then when this opioid epidemic took hold and year after year after year we began to create more and more opiate addicted uh, americans the, the mexican trafficking world responded as they always had with okay let's you know let's find a drug and, and of course heroin was the drug that they they first turned to it was only after we'd opened that pandora's box that they begin to understand oh wow if we sell fentanyl we could first of all make it dirt cheap and it is so cheap um that, that we would make profits like un unheard of up to now you know and so our opioid epidemic kind of un unlocked a new market for them and then they on the on the on the, on the way discovered uh that fentanyl was a much much better uh, uh option than just growing poppies were, were people who are using opioids then using fentanyl is that how it works frequently frequently this is the case yeah although they've of course expanded that market beyond just that those those folks but yes folks who were on uh, opioids or maybe were using what they thought uh, heroin now with with fentanyl coming coming in and in large amounts first from china and then and then just from straight from mexico uh, um, those folks began to buy heroin that, that was called heroin but it actually had uh it was also mainly just fentanyl and um what we began to see then was uh, clusters of overdose deaths because fentanyl is much more potent and the tolerance that you have to heroin you may have if you're an addict addicted to heroin is nothing compared to the tolerance you're going to need to survive fentanyl so a lot of people began to die and the other problem that began to be clear is that clear on the, on the street level dealers began to understand that this was the this was like winning the lottery is the biggest most profitable drug that ever come down but they needed to mix it it's so potent that just a few small grains will will too much will kill people so they had to mix it into larger inert powders powders that didn't do anything and so it was the first time the trafficking and the dealing drug dealing world in america saw its profits and very tantalizing profits at that tied to their ability to mix a drug. The problem is they're really, really bad at mixing drugs. They don't care about. Don't know how to do it. And for a lot of uh, those first years, uh, what narcotics agents were finding was that there was the myth circulating on the street that the best, very best way to mix your fentanyl with another kind of powder, lactose or whatever it was going to be, the very best way to do that was using a magic bullet blender. The magic bullet blenders that you see at um, Target for twenty nine ninety five. This was kind of this myth that certain. So they began to find all these magic bullet blenders at these mixing sites. It was crazy. Or coffee grinders too, as another one. But it showed you how how rudimentary and 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 amateurish this whole thing was. And that's why you began to see early on in the fentanyl scourge. Uh, you know, you began to see all these people dying in clusters because the mix was so bad that some people would get. 
uh, a, a dose that had almost no fentanyl, and others would get way too much and kill them almost immediately. Oh, interesting. And, and so, is does fent- is fentanyl usually taken then mixed with something else? Is that how you have to do it, or can you even just take fentanyl itself? And, and how would well, you- fentanyl itself is? I mean, a few like if you imagine a few grains of salt, just a few grains of salt. Yeah. That is about as much as your body can take of fentanyl. So you can't really, that, that's a very non-commercial way of selling fentanyl. The, the, on, on the street, you couldn't sell it that, that way. Um, so you have, they, to put it get, into you have to put it in something else that adds up to a quarter gram or a gram or whatever. But of course, as I said, that means that you have to know how to mix it. And of course, you know, these folks are just they're like guys in their mom's basement in their boxer shorts or some guy uh, whipping it up in his uh, apartment kitchen or something like that. These are not like major uh, pharmaceutical mixing uh, uh, experts or anything like that, of course. With the opioid addiction crisis, that was largely seen as something that hit white communities in this yes. country. Not exclusively, but that's, that's largely how it was seen. Uh, you write in this new book of yours, The Least of Us, the fentanyl addiction has also moved to other communities. Yes, and that's because of the enormous supply of this stuff. So think, if you think of it a little bit like salt, it's just we spread, put salt on all our food, you know, just kind of by habit. Well, it's because it's so cheap and it's so available, right? Well, something similar happened in the drug trafficking world, uh, particularly at the lower street levels, uh, dealing levels, where people began to understand at the lower levels that if they put fentanyl, first of all, if they put it in heroin, if they had some diluted heroin that wasn't too strong, they put some fentanyl in, all of a sudden it was really potent and people began flocking to them because they heard how 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 potent their their dope was so the first thing people began to add it to was what was called heroin and it turns out to have some heroin in it but really what the the bigger the big kick was um uh, fentanyl that then began to spread to other drugs that idea let's let's well we can put it in cocaine too and methamphetamine. So with cocaine, it was particularly um, uh, dramatic, the, 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 the change, because a lot of that cocaine comes from Colombia. It's been diluted a few times. So people saw, hey, we can put this in there. And they also understood another thing, that if we put fentanyl in a drug like cocaine, which people buy, you know, occasionally, cocaine buyers don't buy every day, you know, it's like every weekend or whatever. Um, if we, but if we put fentanyl in there soon, we will transform that person into an opioid addict and an opioid addict has to buy his dope every single day because he's got to keep the dope sickness away. And that's what began to happen along the way that began to kill a lot of cocaine consumers. Now, cocaine is consumed by people of all races, but what was notable about this is that it began to really kill lots and lots of African Americans. So for the first time, you see African Americans kind of wrapped up, so to speak, in the opioid epidemic. They're dying of an opioid overdose, even though really what they think they're using is cocaine. You saw this most recently with Michael K. Williams, the wonderful actor, one of our great actors, really, that, that fellow, um, if you saw The Wire, is just a magnificent piece of acting that guy did. Uh, he thought he was using, he died uh, in New York City in his apartment and, and, and thinking he was using cocaine. He'd struggled with a cocaine addiction. Uh, but the, the autopsy showed, I read, um, you know, a, 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 a fentanyl or an analog to fentanyl. Um, and so this began to happen all across the country. You saw this in Los Angeles a, a, a couple months ago where at a party, um, uh, three comics um, uh, thought they were using cocaine and they, you know, this cocaine they were using, but also within it was fentanyl and then all three of them, all three of them died. Another person OD'd and was revived at the, uh, at the, um, ER. So this kind of, but this kind of thing has opened the door to, uh, uh startling alarming rates of overdose death to opioids on the part of African Americans, which really was not part of the opioid epidemic. It was largely a, a uniracial problem almost from the beginning and when i wrote dreamland my first book about this topic uh, i was i was struck by that fact that this was really um, like a uniracial issue it involved uh significant numbers of native americans on reservations as well but uh, but the the overwhelming numbers were were white people all of all classes uh and now you're seeing now you're seeing that spread because of the because of cocaine being 
um, a, a drug of choice in the in the drug using African American community. Are, are some drug dealers then secretly adding fentanyl to other drugs without the people who are buying them knowing to what make those drugs maybe more addictive? Yes, is that correct. The, uh, that's that's pretty much in, in in my book. In the least of us, I tell the story of the first African American to die of a fentanyl overdose, uh, thinking it was cocaine, in the city of Akron, uh, Ohio, which was one of the first cities hit by this problem back. And this was in 2014. Mikey Tanner uh, was his name. Wonderful guy. Um, uh, I talked with his sisters about him, um, and he had, had struggled with cocaine for about ten years and was in a uh, a sober living house. And got a hold of some cocaine, and um, you know he lasted ten years on cocaine. Uh, he didn't last a month once fentanyl hit the drug stream, uh, and and uh, and that was the first example of uh, of an African American in Akron. Now it began to spread Cleveland, et cetera, all throughout Ohio. Began to see this more and more. Now you see it pretty much all across the country as as traffickers or dealers have simply seen that you can create a new form of uh, a customer, an addicted. Opioid addicted customer will be a far, far more regular customer than any cocaine customer ever was. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Sam Quinones. Sam Quinones is a journalist, formerly with the Los Angeles Times. In 2016, he won the National Book Critics Circle Award for his book, Dreamland, The True Tell of America's Opiate Epidemic. He's now out with a new book called The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. Is... Where I, I mean, I remember talking to you a number of years ago, Sam, about your previous book and about opioids. And we talked a lot about uh, the 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 profit aspect of these drugs and where the money is going with fentanyl, and we'll also get to uh, sort of a new form of methamphetamines as well. Is there also financial interests that keep this propped up and, and hard to, to to address and, and to get at? Uh, I would I would say that the synthetic drugs in general appeal to traffickers. They don't have any real appeal to to customers per se. I mean, the the, the reason that we have all these drugs coming in from uh, from Mexico that are now synthetic have replaced plant drugs. We're really in a, an era in which synthetics have. We're in the synthetic era of drug drug uh, uh, profiteering now, and the reason is because they it makes so much more profit sense. You don't have to have land, seasons, irrigation, farmers. You can hide in a, in a lab, hide from the helicopters. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why you would want to make your own drugs um, f- uh, in a laboratory with chemicals only. Once you have enough chemicals, you can make these drugs uh, year round, not according to the seasons. And the only so now what really matters is not land as it used to for many years in the Mexican trafficking world. They were all farmers and ranchers, the pioneers of that world. Now their grandchildren are like onto a whole different, whole different world. Now land doesn't really matter anymore. What matters is access to shipping ports. When you have access to shipping ports, you can get access to the world's chemical markets and make um, just, just staggering quantities of these drugs, which is exactly what we're seeing, seeing now. So there's this enormous profit motive that is, you know, already enhanced over drug world's very high profit um, uh, uh, motive uh, bef- uh, with plant drugs. It's just remarkable. Um, you know, I-, I talked to a kid in the, in the least of us, uh, uh, a fellow from Orange County who who imported some some fentanyl uh, uh, from China and began to set up about a pill press and began to make these pills. And, and he went and, and, and did the math for me. And he, he said, um, I could make of a f- eight, five thousand dollar investment in fentanyl, I could make two million dollars. And to me, that, that was a startling thing to hear. Um, and, 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 but I think that that is really what's going on here. All these people in, in Mexico and in the United States are viewing synthetic drugs, particularly fentanyl, as their next lottery ticket, basically. And so there's just this huge glut of the stuff because it can be made year round and people flocking to sell it uh, because uh, it's so dirt cheap. And, and, and you create your own demand when you begin to sell it in the ways I've described. Access to shipping ports. What, what does that mean? Does that mean that they have a crate that comes in from another part of the world and they have their own diesel trucks that go and pick up these crates and, and take them away? Um, the almost. Like that? Uh, the, 
Yeah, almost. And that's what it means. And there's two shipping ports on the co Pacific coast of Mexico, which is the great drug uh, producing regions, the great drug trafficking regions of Mexico from Sinaloa down to Michoacan and Guerrero, including Nayarit, Durango, Chihuahua, and on up really to, um, of course, to the border, Tijuana and Sanada and, 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 and Mexicali. But um, uh, there's two ports. One is in the state of Colima and Manzanillo, city of Manzanillo. The other is in the state of Michoacan, uh, Lazaro Carnes. These are very large ports and traffickers have control over what they need to bring in to those ports. And of course, a lot of stuff comes in that doesn't affect them, but but they have access to world chemical markets. And from them, they can get drugs, uh, I'm sorry, chemicals from, um, you know, China, India, but it really almost doesn't m matter now. It, they could get these dr these chemicals from almost anywhere, you know, Czech Republic, Chile, who knows? Um, but that's what you get when if you have that access and of course, the corruption in Mexico allows that to happen and um, some huge profits that they're making um, and the enormous gun supply that they have continually fed to them uh, from stolen guns or guns that are ex smuggled south from the United States is a major reason why they enjoy that impunity. But yes, those, the, that's pretty much what happens. There's enormous quantities of chemicals coming in and allowing them to make these these now synthetic drugs in the quantities that that they want what, what are these chemicals that make fentanyl and what are what, what is the effect on on our i guess nervous system well fentanyl fentanyl is is, a, is an opioid so the effect on the nervous system is to do what heroin or uh, it's a depressant uh, you know or other um uh, opioids will will do it 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 brings you down. It slows you down. Um, you get kind of dopey. <laughs> um, you uh, it, it can be very highly addictive. It can bring your tolerance. The, the, the key thing about fentanyl, I think, for, for our conversation is that it can bring your converse, your your tolerance, sorry, up much much higher than it than than heroin. So in um, so what we're seeing now is a fascinating thing. It's really happening on the streets, and that is that that fentanyl is really crowding heroin out. If you use if you're a fentanyl addict with a tolerance of very high. And you use um, um, uh, heroin. Heroin will not keep the dope sickness away anymore. And so, what you're seeing is heroin being slowly crowded out. And I believe in a few years, we it may reach the point where we don't see any heroin at all, really, on the street. Maybe called heroin, still is in a lot of areas, but really, it's it's just it's just um, fentanyl. So you're seeing now, as the supply has has really saturated the United States, and have dealers taken to using it in all manner of ways. Um, you're seeing people now using fentanyl at, at doses that would have killed them two years ago, say three years ago or whatever. And now they, they just need it all, all every, every single day. What that means is, what that means is that you can't not have fentanyl anymore. I mean, this is something you absolutely have to have. People are asking for it. They know that what's in their dope is not heroin. It's not, it's cocaine maybe, but it's really fentanyl. Everybody kind of knows this now on, on, the, on, the, on the streets. And so you're seeing really the spread of a fentanyl addiction. This creates with it a, a whole other host of, of issues. One is that when people overdose, there's a, there's a, 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 a drug called Narcan, which revives you from opioid overdose, you need one or two hits of Narcan to get you out of a heroin overdose. You need more like several um, to get you out of a fentanyl uh, overdose. It also means that people die far, far more easily um, because there's, even though they have a high tolerance, there is no way of actually knowing or being able to consistently properly mix this stuff. It's just too, too loose and too unregulated and too crazy on the streets. So what that means is, what that really means is that there is no such thing as a long-term street user of fentanyl, as there was with heroin. Heroin, you could stay on the street uh, using heroin for, for decades. I've met people who were using heroin for 30 years. They didn't have a great life by any means, but but they weren't dead. And now fentanyl really means the you will die. It's almost a, a guarantee because there's no good, easy, consistent, expert way of mixing it on, 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 the, on the street. Well, then that would seem to me that it would not be a very smart investment for drug dealers then to be selling fentanyl because if it's going to kill off the clientele, well, then you're, wouldn't you rather have the heroin user that could live on the streets for a number of years and keep buying the drug? 
Um, yeah, you'd think that would be the case, but actually there's several good reasons why you would add, if you're a dealer, why you would add fentanyl to your mix. One is, as I said earlier, to, that um, that fentanyl uh, will create a new customer, a daily customer from a person who's buying your stimuli, your cocaine, say, uh, on weekends, now that person's going to become your customer every every single day. Among street addicted folks um, uh, to opioids, to it's a, it's very common, and it goes back a number of years, predating fentanyl quite a bit. That whenever someone dies of an of an overdose, that might be you know a little alarming to folks, but really it's not a warning. It's more more than a warning. It's an advertisement. You know, it's saying this guy over here has really great dope let's go get it that happened when that when that those first batches of fentanyl were uh, hitting uh um chicago in 2006 i told you about the authorities in chicago thinking it was a bad batch of heroin put up a big sign big signs warnings bad batch potent very potent heroin uh, circulating be very careful and what happened was people flocked to the housing projects where it was being sold so it, it, this kind of thing happens over and over. So it actually makes a lot of sense once you're in it. And the other thing is this, it may not make individual people may not want to kill their customers. It's true. But the truth, the other truth is this, once people start getting addicted to fentanyl, the person who the dealer who doesn't have any fentanyl in his dope, whatever it is he's selling, if there's no fentanyl in it very quickly, will be have no customers. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a business survival thing at a certain point where people are now insist, demand that the, 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 the stuff they're buying has fentanyl because that's the only thing that's going to keep their dope sickness away. Now, if I were to get some cocaine that is laced with fentanyl, these I, it sounds like are two drugs that have opposite effects on a person. Would I be able to tell that it's laced with fentanyl? Uh, you, you, would, you would most likely start do being kind of dopey. You know, and, and falling asleep and like, oh, you know, that kind of thing. And that, that's not what I, I think I about to, with cocaine. Yeah. And it, it, it would, it, well, I mean, it depends on what, what the mix was, of course. But it, 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 generally speaking, I, t I spoke with a woman who, who began to suspect this uh, transgender woman who was being pimped out by, uh, uh, by, 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 uh, by drug dealers and, and kind of crips down in LA. And, and, and she, she noticed that they began to give her methamphetamine with fentanyl in it because she would be on meth falling asleep, her nod, head nodding and that kind of thing. And she's like, meth does not uh, do that. And, and so it would be that kind of contradictory r response. And, and it depends on the mix, how, how much uh, you would be nodding off. So how does methamphetamine fit into the story? Methamphetamines aren't necessarily new i i grew up uh in the no. 90s in a town that was hit hard by the meth uh, addiction pandemic uh what but what it was what's happening now with meth similar to what we're seeing with fentanyl or are they being laced with yeah sure uh, you know lab? meth meth taught traffickers in mexico that first lesson which was that f synthetic drugs are much better to make um, and more profitable, easier, easier to smuggle, less risk, et cetera, much better option. And that's, they, they learn that issue, that thing first from, from methamphetamine. Then fentanyl comes along and they're like, oh, wow, this is right in our wheelhouse. Well, what happened with methamphetamine was used to be that bikers would make it in this method. It was very smelly, very stinky, not very efficient. Then the Mexicans really outcompeted them by taking over a method, uh, in the San Diego, Tijuana area and then into the Central Valley of California and down into Mexico, a method they use a, a, a chemical called ephedrine, which is a decongestant found in like Sudafed pills and that kind of thing. And uh, very easy to make meth from that, a very easy chemical process. Uh, it was a, the drug that you made was kind of a euphoric, it was a party drug. You were wanted to be the center of attention. It was big in the gay community. Everybody used it for social reasons and you'd stay up in a long, long time, sometimes days. But, um, and, and after four or five days, you might start seeing shadow people. Your mind might, might start playing some tricks on you. But basically it was a party drug and, and it was very easy to make and they industrialized that. And they made quantities um, that, um, you know, it's kind of one to one with ephedrine, as much ephedrine they can my, may find. That's how much uh, a meth they can make. And they covered uh, parts of the Western United States, never got east of the Mississippi River, didn't cover the entire West. And then all that changed. 
and brings us into the modern uh, times where we're talking about right right now, in which the Mexican government made ephedrine illegal, except for some pharma companies to uh, make down uh, possess down in Mexico, and the trafficking world in Mexico had to switch um, from the ephedrine method. They couldn't find ephedrine in the quantities they needed, so they began to switch to this other method. It was very smelly and stinky. And, and used uh, a lot of different chemicals, but therein lay the advantage they came to realize, I think, that the chemicals you needed to make this new meth, make the precursor in this new meth, which is a chemical called P2P, phenol 2 propanone. Uh, you can make phenol 2 propanone, P2P, on uh, many, many different ways with a lot of different run of the mill, industrial, uh, legal, toxic. Uh, uh, chemicals. And that's and so if governments c crack down on this group of chemicals, you could switch to another way of making. And so what it really meant is you can make this stuff um, with, you know, if you had access again to shipping ports, you could make this stuff forever. And it didn't matter what government did, you could, you could switch the, the, the recipe up uh, very easily. And that is really what began to happen. 2009 is kind of the first year, but it really, because of some things I get into in the book, there really isn't the liberation of production until about 2012, 13, 14. And then it's just explosive. I mean, really staggering supplies start coming out of, of Mexico because more and more people start getting into the production of, of this stuff. We call, you know, it's interesting to note, we call these groups cartels. They are, they are not classically cartels in the, in the economic sense where cartels are groups that, that reduce supply to force price up. The opposite is happening with, with both fentanyl and, and, and meth. So you have these guys cascading into start starting to make that because the chemicals are just un, unrelenting coming into mexico and what begins begins to happen in 2013 is you begin to see this new meth march across the country la portland seattle san francisco arizona is vegas first and then in 2013 14 by 15 16 and 17 definitely you can feel this it's all over the midwest it's in ohio about pennsylvania it's in in um uh, tennessee indiana etc cetera, etc cetera, all these different states and by 2019 it has marched this way all the way up into new england which never had any meth uh, uh to speak of and so and, and at the same time the stunning fact is they are making so much that not only do they cover the country, but the price drops by 80%. The prices in Nashville, where I'm currently staying, um, went from uh, $1,200 an ounce to $250 an ounce, an 80% drop in price. This kind of price drop is seen all across the country. But, in, but something else also comes with this, this dope. And that is, the, the, as this march of methamphetamine takes place, what begins to see, people begin to see is a very rapid onset of the symptoms of schizophrenia, very severe paranoia. This is no longer a party drug. It's no longer the ephedrine thing where everyone wants to party. It's a drug where very quickly you go insane, mad. Um, you have you're in very severe paranoia and in florid just florid hallucinations of all kinds of things coming at you. And, and, um, and of course, people can't uh, live in, you know, organized settings that way. And so people are very quickly homeless, along with this meth uh, is a comp this meth is accompanied by uh, rapid onset schizophrenia, meth induced schizophrenia, it seems, and very quickly homelessness. And these are people who can't you know, they can't live even in homeless shelters. In fact, homeless shelters might be some of the scariest places for these folks uh, uh, of all. And so what you begin to see, that's when you begin to see the rise of the tent encampments. Tent, tent encampments and tents itself themselves form a perfect form of lodging for someone who is tormented by these scary, scary apparitions and, and ideas of who's coming. You know, it's a way of hiding out on your own in a place where no one is going to come into your little world. And so what you begin to see is not only the, the symptoms of schizophrenia, you begin to see more homelessness, but you also begin to see the rise of tent encampments. And you begin to see these, of course, on the Western United States. But it's also true that these things are 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 popping up in areas that never had any homelessness to begin with. I, I, uh, in, in the least of us, I, I told the story of Clarksburg, West Virginia, never had homelessness. And that's meth arrives 
in the spring of 2017. And within a year, they've got this big homeless um, population that's wandering the streets in backpacks and hats turned backwards and, and, and nothing else and, and stripping homes uh, that are va left vacant a little bit, stripping them all of everything of value. And it's a, it's a scary, scary idea what this stuff is doing to communities uh, uh, creating these kinds of uh, homeless problems where none existed before. Does fentanyl and these new methamphetamines travel together, or are these two separate, independent phenomena that are occurring? Well, I think I think you know I think both. You know, the the drug trafficking world is a fascinating world because it's it's all it can be a lot of different things at once. Um, it can be methamphetamine with fent with fentanyl mixed into it. It can be one guy just says, "I've only got I've only got um, um, meth for you here," and then another guy's only selling fentanyl. It's a large variety of things, and it's it can be it can be all things. Because here's the thing: the thing is always this gets back to the story is always about supply. We have so much supply now that you can find all kinds of different ways of, of selling it and people to sell it to and on and on like that it is just it's just constantly morphing because the, the what the, what it's a fascinating thing when you when you look at street drug dealing one of the biggest concerns has always been time immemorial for dealers on the street where do i get my supply who is my connection Drug, the drug war um, is widely criticized, but one of the things it always did was keep dealers off balance because were, all their connections were always being arrested. And uh, that was a good thing. They never really got c comfortable. In this, but now they've solved that problem because the supply is just, you know, uh, endless, it seems. It just never stops coming. And so now the big question is where do you sell it? It's not just where do I get it, it's where do I sell it because there's so so much of it, so many people are competing. So you think, you hear these stories in Louisville, for example, um, there was so much meth began to cascade into, into Louisville, Kentucky, that the dealers there began to advertise, we'll bring it to you or we'll give you, we'll give you a syringe fully loaded with the dope so you can inject it right after you buy it. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of part of the, the, the world out there, uh, out there now. What's also happened in Mexico is that they have taken to making fentanyl in putting fentanyl into counterfeit, um, prescription pills. So these are pills that look like Percocets or Xanax or, uh, oxycodone 30 milligram generic, uh, pills. They just contain fentanyl. And, uh, these pills now too are being, being manufactured in, in just, Again, staggering, but them tens of millions, it seems. Um, and then, so what, what, what the new dilemma, again, as I said, for dealers is where do I sell this stuff? Well, now what you're finding is one venue, particularly during the COVID uh, years, um, is that um, uh, the new street corner is Snapchat, Instagram, uh, TikTok, gaming platforms where, where folks are, are selling these counterfeit pills. Uh, to kids, frequently to kids, frequently kids who are, can't leave the house, so they deliver it to them and and um, online all the time on their phones constantly. And these are kids who really don't have any experience with the drug world or or very very little, very very naive. And those are, those kids, th that's another phenomenon that is taking the lives of many 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 kids across the country now. Issue of homelessness is important here. And I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. I live specifically in Oakland. We've always had homelessness in Oakland. Uh, but in the last five years, we've seen it explode, uh, the number of people who right. are living uh, in the streets. Now, I, I hear the drugs, but there's I think there's also an economic element of it. I have the, the cost of living in Oakland has skyrocketed as well. Rents have been raised astronomically. I, I have former neighbors who were barely making it by before suddenly priced out and I, I would see them out out on the street. But at the same right. time, as I'm just thinking this all through, um, I, I also can't help but notice how many people that I'm just assuming out are in the streets that have mental illness. Because right. And I out. think th here's the thing there. Are, we talk about homelessness as, as if it's one thing. The truth is, when you get into homelessness, there are a myriad stories and they're very complex. And um, but generally speaking, um, people who are what you might homeless due to a shredded safety net. 
that's a very different kind of homelessness than people who are uh, uh, on meth and, and, and mentally ill because of because of it. It's a di very different thing. Um, and and I think first of all, the people who have had their sh safety net shredded, which is a, a, a kind of a thing that you're you're talking about, which which I'm quite sure happens a lot up in the in the bay area are folks who you know uh have a surgery they lose their job and they can't afford surgery and and a house or yeah they're, they're the rents go up uh 30 percent uh and then another 20 percent or whatever it happens to be and pretty soon they just can't afford it um those are folks though who aren't who are probably have more resources and can more make better use of the resources that maybe nonprofits or the state provides the folks that i am talking about are folks that i'm quite sure you have seen many of um who it doesn't matter what you give them they are not prepared on meth to do this and, and could be some are taking many are taking whatever happens to be available and a lot of times that is really the attitude on uh, on the street and whatever happens to be available now happens to be methamphetamine it's just so cheap and so prevalent and so you see these these symptoms of again of of, of mental illness very very uh, pronounced among people that's a different kind of homelessness i think we need to get in the habit of talking about the different forms of homelessness there's a there's a homelessness that comes with um leaving prison and not having any family that want to talk to you um, that's one form of homelessness that, uh, that can become the other, you know, um, there's right, a, all these the, things can uh, lead to drug addiction. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then there's also, um, uh, um, the sex registrant homeless. These are folks who have to register as sex offenders. And, you know, so many communities have, have barred, uh, areas where they can live. Um, and so they end up homeless. And what ends up happening is then, of course, you've got this enormously prevalent drug that's out there and people start getting into that. And then the meth makes it almost impossible for them to ever resolve their homelessness. You got, so you get these swirling currents, but, but without methamphetamine, I don't believe we would see, uh, I don't know, it's impossible to put a number on it, I don't think, I, I think, but, but it's certainly a dramatic amount of the homelessness that we're seeing in San Francisco, I suspect, but certainly in LA where I'm from, you know, it's just clear that this is this is a, a meth induced uh, problem or enhanced problem or making things worse for, for folks who are already kind of um, uh, on their backs. Are we as a society failing these folks? I mean, it's a tough thing to do to, to deal with. Um, uh, you know, it's it's hard to convince people who who have put billions into homeless um, services that that um that there's a, a way forward when after billions into homeless services there's more homeless than ever ever before i think people need to understand what i think we really need to do on all this i have to tell you um uh, that that this gets back to a very uh, a real problem in our in our public discourse and our and our and our news coverage and so on um that this story has ne has i'm the first one i i think it's safe to say i'm the first one that's re who's really reporting this problem with with methamphetamine's connection to to homelessness why is that ask yourself why on earth that would be i'm a book writer i write books that take three four years to, to write you have reporters out there of all kinds all across California, stepping or stepping, stepping over or around this problem almost on a daily basis. Why do the problem, the stories about homelessness never include uh, the word methamphetamine or any discussion of this problem? I mean, it's so common not to, to see these stories. Why is it that I, a book writer, would scoop, would break this, this story in a book? You know, and to me, what I think happened has happened is that there's this very, um, a pronounced self-censorship that comes along with writing about anybody who is supposed to be viewed as a victim. You do not want to. There's this feeling like we as journalists should not uh, make people who are view should be viewed as victims uh, further stigmatizing them, uh, supposedly, with discussions of, of what is really the core problem. The problem is this is what's going on here. No one has reported it. And therefore, we come up with these solutions that don't make any sense. Like we need to give housing to these folks who are who are mentally ill. 
you will never find a successful solution to a person's homelessness if that person's on methamphetamine by giving that person a house. That person needs to detox first for quite a long time, needs to go through recovery, and then uh, a house becomes possible. But in, in the florid, you know, kind of uh, schizophrenia in which these people are operating, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. But that, that is an outgrowth of what I think is really, you see it in San Francisco, you see it in Los Angeles, I think, um, where particularly in the news media, there's no, no desire to really um, address this in any forthright uh, way. We need to confront this problem as the problem that it is. And that means talking about the very severe driver that methamphetamine is in our homelessness and mental illness uh, problems that we have on the, on, on, in cities on the West Coast and, and elsewhere in the United States. I suspect it would be hard to detox if you're on the streets. Um, how, how do Impossible. people then? Impossible to do that while the supplies come in in such staggering amounts as we are seeing now. I don't see how it's possible. Some people may be able to do it, uh, you know, I guess maybe impossible is an exaggeration, but I swear it seems to me that the, the other thing that, tr that people and in, in, in treatment providers say is that this meth is very difficult to treat until you get the person well detoxed because y drug treatment, drug recovery, involves human connection it means conversations dealing with the other person other people and 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 having these conversations and being kind of a mentor but when the person before you is speaking in what they call word salad kind of jumbles of words and bizarre uh, uh hallucinations and paranoia there is no ability to establish that connection that is a very important part of why it's so difficult to treat this stuff. There's also no medicine, as there was with opioids, you know, there's no medicine to help subdue the cravings, that kind of thing. So the only way to really get off of methamphetamine is just simply to separate from it. And that's why it's so difficult uh, to do that on the street. You do chronicle some people who were able to get off fentanyl. How'd they do it? How, how, I, I miss what you said. I'm sorry. How, how did they get off it? Off the, the people, I'm sorry. Uh, fentanyl. Um, uh, uh, well, I would say that the number of people that I found who were able to get off methamphetamine five and eight years into this, very rare. I found two. Uh, I'm sure there were more, obviously, but but it's not easy easy to find. And I think it's really separation. The folks that I talked to, they were able to move to a place where the stuff wasn't available, uh, uh, controlled housing of some, one kind or another off the street, um, and that began their healing. And a lot of it just has to do with, um, I interviewed a woman in, in uh, Central Oregon who, um, who she was barking like a dog and, and seeing all kinds of strange things and very, very um, scared of being around any other person. And she basically went through a kind of a detox, separated, and, and little by little, her brain began to heal. And she told this very poignant story, I thought, um, of when uh, she first began to feel again. It took her six months of no, not using this dope to feel once again. And she, began, she watched it with a roommate uh, the movie called Made in Manhattan with uh, Jennifer Lopez, kind of a schmaltzy movie. And she watched this movie and suddenly she was filled with this poignant kind of, she just began to cry and cry from happiness because all of a sudden she began to feel for the characters. It was a remarkable story, I thought, because it was this movie that's really not very good, but she didn't care. She was like, it was like connecting to something and somebody in a way that the meth had damaged her brain so deeply that it, that she could not do for, a, it took her six months. It also, by the way, almost melted her teeth. She had to get all kinds of new teeth. This is a, a, another problem with that stuff. But, but it was this remarkable story of how she just kind of moved into feeling again. And this is what you find drug, Treatment folks say this often that I've talked to, and they say, what, what happens is we see people come to us without a person, they've had their personality kind of stripped, you know, like there's like zombies, like moving strange ways and flat effect and nothing there, no personality there. Spoke with a woman in Eastern Tennessee who runs a recovery center, and she said it takes usually three to six months before we can see a personality emerge on the person that we're we're dealing with and then when that happens then recovery can has a chance to begin but it really needs that and that that is a very difficult thing to achieve while you're out on the street 
That, that's remarkable. You've traveled the country reporting on this story, and you found just two people who are able to kick the habit of, of methamphetamines. My point is that it's very rare. I don't. I mean, there's many. There's probably other people. Obviously, I don't want to want to. Uh, no, no, I, I, I get that. And you, you you mentioned that before. But but it wasn't yeah. like you just stayed in one city yeah. writing this book. No, it was it was very difficult to do, and it generally requires some kind of separation. The other guy was Eric Barrera, a guy um, I mentioned in the book who is a um, former Marine. I met him when he was a homeless outreach coordinator, but he was the first one. He told me. In 2009, I had been using meth for eight years, had a great time, a party, la di all that stuff. In 2009, it, uh, it changed, and I began to feel this extraordinary violent paranoia, began stabbing walls, and that hit me. We were at a pizza place, and I said, wait, what, 2009? Because that hit me. That was the ex- year after Mexico had made ephedrine illegal, and now this new way of making meth was taking hold. And, and, and he said, yeah, I never felt the euphoria again. I was addicted to it, though I couldn't stop using it. But there was no reason why I would really use it, because it was a very sinister thing. I was all alone with my pornography. My dad kicked me out. Mom kicked me out. Girlfriend kicked me out. Nobody. Went, I was homeless for the first time in 13 years of using meth, he said. Finally, he gets clean by going to the VA, and, and they help him with housing. And, and he comes separated, and his brain has some time to, to heal. And then he becomes... A, uh, a, a homeless outreach coordinator among these tent encampments. And what he said to me was very poignant. Eric told me, the thing that strikes me is that now that I'm uh, out in the homeless encampments every day, that I am seeing people with the same pronounced uh, degree of mental degradation and decomposition that, was, that I was in for, for four years. You have to see it all the time. He said... 80, 90% of the people I'm dealing with and I'm wandering, they are, they are uh, affected by um, this, this, this methamphetamine and the symptoms of mental, mental illness. It's not to say there's a lot of other people who are homeless, but the folks we're talking about in these encampments and so on, it's, it's, it's a meth-driven phenomenon. Sam Quinones has been our guest. Sam Quinones is a former reporter with the Los Angeles Times, and he is the author of the book that he's joined us to talk about called The Least of Us, True Tells of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. Sam Quinones, thank you so much for your time. It's great to be here with you, Mish. Thank you very much.